Okay. This meeting is being recorded. Okay. So good afternoon, everyone. We are in our uh, 52 sections, a section of our partial differential equation and applied mathematics seminar. And today we are honored to welcome Professor Panagiotis Suganidis uh, from the University of Chicago, who will be presented by our colleague Diego Souza. And the next speaker will be Professor Mikhail Libanov from the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. That will be presented by Professor Primenko. So, Diego, uh, it's it's your time to introduce, to start, please. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Sandra. Uh, so, uh, it's a great honor for us to, to have as, as a speaker, Professor uh, Panagiotis Soganidis uh, from uh, the University of Chicago in USA. Professor Soganidis, uh, he's uh, received uh, his PhD in 83 under the supervision of Professor Michael Crandall. And uh, Professor Soganidis also has received uh, many prizes as uh, this is low on research fellow. Uh, and he was also invited to the International Congress in Industrial and Applied Mathematics. Uh, and he uh, have many publications in very, very important and good journals. Uh, and uh, today, Professor Soganidis is going to talk about the terministic surface growth models. So, Professor, thank you very much for accepting our invitation, and uh, you you can start uh, when you want. Thank you. Thank you very much for the a nice introduction and the invitation. Um, I, as I was saying earlier, I wish I, I could be in Brazil <laughs> right now instead of uh, Chicago, but uh, it's a very nice effort to have this um, seminar so people can still meet and talk. Uh, I, since I don't know exactly the audience, uh, I will spend maybe one third or more of my talk in uh, talking in very general terms about things. And then at, at the last uh, two thirds, I'm going to discuss uh, some recent work, one, uh, two papers. One is uh, with uh, Surav Chatterjee from uh, Stanford, and the other is with uh, uh, Peter Morf, who was a graduate student of mine and now he has moved to um, to Leipzig. Uh, so I'm going to talk about deterministic surface growth models and I will spend a little bit of time um, discussing about what I mean by gro uh, surface growth models before we go to the, the specifics. So the real motivation is to understand uh, interface growth models and these are buzzwords to describe um, interfaces which are boundaries between regions which appear when a system uh, can be decomposed in special regions characterized by struct different structural properties. Uh, the simplest example is uh, ice and water or magnetization species if we are talking about biology and uh, these uh, interfaces typically move and uh, their motion may depend on uh, many parameters of the system like the temperature pressure and and and, and so on and uh, typically these models uh, are uh, one area of mathematics that um, study such kind of models and there are others is statistical physics uh, where um, uh, one uh, tries to simplify this complex and chaotic uh, statistical physics looks at things at the microscopic level and um, to simplify this uh, complex and chaotic microscopic particle interactions uh, one starts making some assumptions and the typical assumption is that uh, transitions from one state to the other uh, are random and um, we one example that one can think of is um, how snow, snow layers uh, built. So you have these snowflakes 
that are coming down and um, a priori the motion of a, of a, of a, a snowflake is erratic uh, but nevertheless uh, in modeling one may uh, assume that uh, there is some rule behind it uh, some stochastic rule uh, which determines where exactly the the flakes will land on the on the on the surface and uh, you can think of similar mechanisms in um, in uh, like crystal growth uh, expansion of bacterial colonies spin dynamics in magnets and so on and uh, all these rules will determine whether a new phase will change or a new quantity will be deposed there and and, and so on um, we are thinking about non-equilibrium random growth models uh, and um, one of the challenges is to explain how these discrete microscopic interfaces that you see with the statistical physics uh, modeling how can they look like smooth and deterministic interfaces and moving at the microscopic scale so again um, uh, think of uh, film growth for example things are are deposited on on, uh, on the surface the surface grows but when you look at it from far away uh, it looks smooth and uh, and so one of the challenges is to understand uh, the smooth motion that you see afterwards and smooth in the sense that is not fragmented and to try to uh, see whether there are some common laws that govern these motions or some common scalings that lead to that motion so uh, when i say macroscopic it just means that uh, macroscopic is a word that has many meanings think of saying that you look at it from far away and you see a nice picture and so the the question that uh, people try to understand very much is whether there is some universality namely uh, each model gives rise to some motion that of course is determined by the by the model but maybe there are some universal properties some scalings that uh, uh, are common for many of these models and uh, the buzzword for that or the thing that uh, people like to understand is this uh, kpz equation the cardar parisi zhang uh, equation which uh, was created as an equation that uh, was modeled as the equation that governs a lot of the properties of these uh, random surface uh, growth models and uh, this uh, the uh, the study of the kpz equation is a subject that uh, is something that has uh, attracted a lot of attention of the last um, I don't know, let's say 15 years or so uh, and um, highlighted by the fields metal for uh, martin heider and um, i'm not going to say anything about the mathematical theory of kpz i will just try to connect it with these random growth models so in 1D, uh, since the 2000s has been uh, in one dimension, has been a lot of progress in the direction of showing that there is indeed some universality of fluctuations for these random uh, interface uh, models, and which is governed by KPZ. In higher dimensions, uh, where typically interfaces are not uh, surfaces, much less is known and uh, part of the problem is that the kpz equation doesn't make sense in more than one space dimension so when i say dimension here i mean space and i would like to uh, to explain a little bit this issue um, so but i have to say more before uh, 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 we get to that so now let's start putting some rules for this microscopic uh, evolution uh so if we just as i said earlier with the example of the snowflakes uh if we don't put some rules the thing is impossible to understand it's uh, any, anything can happen and uh um so the rules are simplifying the model and they say for example that the growth depends on the position and the speed of uh, nearby part, huge number of particles and you try to average and uh, in statistical physics it is assumed that the macroscopic evolution is characterized by some random transitions 
which depends, I said, I said earlier, pressure, temperature, magnetic field, and so on. So now I'm going to become more specific and try to explain a little bit uh, what are these, um, what I call elementary transitions. And the typical rule is that uh, the microscopic evolution is modeled by Markov chains. Uh, so, and by that, I mean that condition on its present state, the future states are independent from the past. So when you look again at the growth of, uh, of uh, the snow and the snowflakes, uh, what happens uh, uh, tomorrow depends only of what is happening today and not of what happened some time ago. Uh, why do we use Markov chains? It's because it's the simplest probabilistic model one can think. Uh, it's like a probabilistic automaton and uh, they are used because they are easy to, to simulate numerically in a computer and there is a very rich mathematical theory. So key thing here is that the rules we're imposing to understand this um, growth is Markov. And uh, typically it's irreversible Markov chains because uh, you cannot go backwards in time. Once you see the snow, the growth of the, of the snow layer, you cannot go back in time and see where it came from. So uh, uh, and let's discuss about uh, the, one of the most elementary examples and uh, that uh, goes back to 1956. And this has to do with the bacterial uh, colony expansion. And so this is the canonical model you should think. Uh, we have um, a plane or the space is tiled. If we are in the plane, there are a lot of squares. And initially there is one, only one square that is occupied. And then at each step, the bacteria expand uh, on a randomly chosen perimeter square of the cluster. So for some reason, we have a bacteria in a cluster, in, in a square, and it decides to go up, down, left or right. And this keeps going. And eventually you start seeing this, what I call, what you see here in the screen, this black uh, surface, which uh, not a curve or whatever you want to call it, which is the area that is um, full of bacteria. And then the gray is the area that is going to, uh, that is the boundary of where you're going to be at uh, the next step. And so the, we call by CN, the cluster which obtain after N steps. This process is, as I said, is irreversible. Uh, you don't know where it came from. And uh, also it does not depend on uh, the previous stages. It only depends the way it goes at the end plus one time. It only depends on where you are here. If the, the motion, whether that square here is occupied or not, has nothing to do with what happened in the previous step down there. Okay, so that's the canonical picture you should have in mind. And depending on the rules you are imposing for this uh, growth, the interface can be random, can be deterministic and, uh, and, and so. so uh, the questions we, one likes to study is to, if we are in the random setting, is to find the probability distribution of the interface to see whether some shapes are more frequent than others, to see what is the shape of the typical random surface for large N, a standard deviation from around stages, uh, average states, and so on. So these are typically the questions one wants to uh, to understand. Uh, by the way, if there is any question, please interrupt me. I, I don't have any. So now all this generalized thing is over. I, I like to uh, go ahead and bring some math in the discussion. And so when we talk about growing random or deterministic interfaces, uh, what we have in mind here is a height function. So we're always going to work on, on, uh, on uh, a tiled space, so ZD. Uh, the next variable will be time. And uh, the random interface will be characterized by this height function. So at every X and T, it's how high you are. And uh, the simplest example of such model is what is known as a random deposition model. So at every location, so think of having uh, particles coming down and uh, where they land, it doesn't depend, it's independent of the heights of the nearby particles. If this thing comes down, 
and, and drops there. And what determines whether it comes down or not is um, some, you flip a, a coin and depending on whether you get uh, P or Q or min one minus P, you drop down to uh, here or not. And it doesn't, this probability doesn't depend on how uh, high it's there. So think of Tetris, the, uh, this game that I think most of us have wasted some time playing in the computer, uh, where you have these random shapes coming down. And uh, in theory, uh, the shapes that come down don't depend on, on the, what is nearby. I mean, I never believe that because in the end I always lose. So there's always something I cannot put in place. Uh, I won't, I'm going to use the word integrable uh, uh, to describe models where everything can be solved explicitly. So think of um, uh, exactly as I said here, uh, above every location X, uh, you flip a coin, things come down or not. And in principle, if you are brave enough and you start writing, we can write down explicitly what will be the, the height function at X and T as a function of the probability of dropping down or not. So I will call integrable models that are uh, we can solve explicitly. Uh, because it's explicitly solvable, one can compute the variance, uh, how much uh, uh, from uh, some average state. And you can see that it grows linearly in time. And uh, so that's the simplest possible model, the random deposition. And you start having difficulties if you allow dependence on heights of, near, of nearby points. So if this probability of dropping or not depends also on how high you are here or low, then the problem becomes much more difficult. And I will try to explain some of this as we move on. So random deposition is the simplest example. So here's now uh, a, a slightly more complicated uh, problem, which is still integrable, meaning it, we can still write down explicitly what happens. And this comes with the name of Edwards Wilkinson. I didn't write down where it shows up. It's, it comes a lot in, in again, in a, a growth of um, bacteria or something. And so the model says the following, at uh, time t plus one, the high and location x, the height is uh, the average of the heights at the previous time of all nearby points. So here the tilde means that y is near x. So if you are in the cube, if you are on the plane, it's the points that are above, below, right, left. So you take an average of that and depends also on some randomness, which is typically uh, IED random variables that depend on the location and the time. And uh, for uh, if we didn't have this random thing, you will recognize here that this looks a little bit like a Laplacian because like the average of the nearby uh, points. Uh, nevertheless, uh, because it's so simple, uh, one can write, uh, so the probabilistic rule I said before, the flipping a coin here doesn't exist. The, this is a deterministic quantity, the average, and the randomness comes from, the, from this additional additive uh, variable so you can write down and one can sit down and, and write explicitly the solution. And uh, the solution would be some linear combination of these uh, IAD random variables. So it's possible to compute, for example, the variance. And then in this case, you see that one, if you do the computation, you see that um, uh, in 1D, the variance is like square root of time, uh, square root of T. So it grows like a square root of T. And if you are in two dimensions, it's like logarithm t. And if you are uh, actually in more than three, dim three dimensions and more, this motion converges to a constant. So this thing has some constant shape asymptotically in time. Um, a more complex, but still integrable model is what is known as the, I'm sorry for the misprint here, is the last passage percolation model. Uh, where again, we have this discrete um, uh, setting. And at time t plus one, uh, the, um, the, um, you, you move according to the high, uh, you move uh, uh, randomly again, but it matters at the highest uh, location before of the nearby points. So it's easy to think, to see that this is something that moves in a certain direction uh, uh, because you just look at the maximum. So we have this quantity here that is average. And this is that the maximum and uh, the randomness. 
Okay. Um, the, so in addition to these examples I show you, like the last passage percolation or the Edwards Wilkinson model, uh, there are many other, uh, several other 1D models, which are integrable, but in, in terms of modeling, they are the exception. Uh, there are many other surface uh, growth models in one dimension and especially higher that are beyond the available mathematical techniques. Uh, you cannot compute them explicitly and um, there are no tools to study what happens. And examples like that are ballistic deposition. So ballistic deposition is what I described uh, earlier, the, the simple random deposition, but now you depend on, on what happens nearby. There is a model that, which I will describe later on that is called the restricted solid on solid model, SOS, is the last passage percolation that I showed before in dimensions more than two. And in reality, any non-trivial model of that surface growth with dimensions greater or equal to, nobody knows what to do. And in particular, the background you should have in mind is that there is no general theory for dynamically uh, random uh, dynamically evolving random surfaces analogous to the uh, to the theory there is for randomly moving points so randomly moving points are stochastic processes uh, randomly uh, evolving surfaces there is no general theory like that okay so it's a it's a very exciting field because it's um uh, for each model you have to come up with uh, with different technique perhaps Okay, so now let's go to the scaling limits I described. So uh, we are touching, and I'm touching now on the, um, the issue of uh, uh, whether there's some commonality. That uh, uh, if you take this uh, height function I defined earlier, and if you scale it in a particular way, whether uh, there is something non trivial at the limit. So here I wrote the scaling, which is uh, uh, epsilon to the beta in X, epsilon to the gamma in T. And um, depending on whether you start from uh, some planar, uh, depending on where, what kind of uh, uh, configuration you start with, you may also want to scale uh, the height. So you want to figure out uh, the alpha, the beta, and the gamma for each model for which the limit of this u epsilon is uh, something non-trivial. And um, so let's think a little about that. So in one dimension, it is believed and at some times is proved that for a large class of models, the correct exponents are a half, three halves, and one. Okay, the one means that basically you scale in terms of time. And this is, and that the scaling limit is the KPZ equation, which was introduced in 86 to describe the growth of generic randomly growing surface. So the KPZ equation, so now I'm, I'm saying what it is is uh, it's just this very simple looking uh, quasi-linear equation. So this is our old Laplacian, the B and C are depending on the model, uh, evolution in time, and uh, it's perturbed by space-time white noise. And the B, C, and kappa are uh, constants that depend on the model, but the, the, the conjecture here or the model was that you take any of, the, of these random, um, uh, surface growth models, and you can you can take the height function, you scale it. There is this universal scaling, and at the limit, you are going to get a solution of the KPZ equation. So that's the that's the conjecture, uh, uh, and uh, a lot of effort has been has been put even as we currently in current times to try to uh, to prove this. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, if you go in more than 1D, you start having difficulties here because uh, space-time white noise in more than one spatial dimension is not clear what it means. So you cannot make sense of that. The work of Heider, and before that, Quastel and others, uh, was in order to develop a well-posedness of this equation in one space dimension. And uh, why is that difficult? Because uh, uh, space-time white noise is uh, plus minus infinity everywhere, you know, almost every, almost surely. So you have this quasi-linear equation with plus minus uh, infinity on the right-hand side, and you need to make some sense of it. 
Okay, so providing rigorous meaning to the KPZ is a major problem. It has been done in 1D. And um, as I said earlier, the progress around this problem is one of the most exciting developments in probability slash analysis and uh, with very few results for dimensions greater than two. Um, <clears throat> now, in most of the cases where this uh, KPZ scaling limit has been established for 1D surfaces, uh, it, th this is based on having uh, exact formulas. So I've been in talks about uh, such kind of models where the blackboard is filled with very precise, difficult, but very precise computations. Where in the end, you realize that uh, these very complex formulas you get, if you scale them in a particular way, you, they will give you the KPC. Um, okay. So now, uh, I, what is the talk about? This is what I said at the beginning, that uh, we spent a, a large amount of time uh, talking in generalities. Uh, I want to, here I want to describe a very complete theory in all dimensions, uh, which leads to some universality or not, but for deterministic surface models. So that's a big simplification, the word deterministic here, but uh, one can try to see whether still, whether there is some universal scaling and, uh, and I will present for you a theory that is complete. Of course, any theory that is complete, it will require some assumptions. And uh, we're going to see that uh, for a large class of models, there is indeed some universality. And uh, for, but for many other models, there is no such universality. Uh, what I mean by KPZ universality, if you are in the deterministic model, you're going to get this equation without a white noise. Okay, so that's what I want to talk about. Uh, and as I said, we're going to find uh, KPZ universality for many not integrable deterministic surface models with smooth dynamics. The key thing here is smooth dynamics. And this will include our old friend, the Edwison Wilkinson models, uh, directed polymers, which was the, the directed percolation, as well. Some of, I haven't told you what these SOS models are, but we'll see them uh, later on. And then we're going to see non-KPZ universality for certain models when the, the dynamics or the update from one step to the other is not smooth. And in this case, we're going to come up with, we're going to, I want to show you that we get some very unusual PDEs that characterize um, the motion of these interfaces, which are related to Finsler metrics. And I put here unusual because honestly, the first time I saw them, I said, okay, I either have made a mistake or I have never seen that before. Um, okay, so that's the goal of the, of the lecture. So uh, let me uh, start with the general description now. Uh, some standard things I'm going to have to use since I'm going to start with um, models on, uh, on ZD. Uh, this will be the notation for the startup basis in RD. Um, uh, there will be this uh, set A in the background that I will be using certain formulas that depends on the origin and all the nearby points. And when I write B, I uh, will take away the origin. So this is just a notation to simplify some of the writing. And um, the growth will be de depend on some function, which uh, takes values on, on the set uh, A. Uh, and I'm sorry, that is defined on points on, the, on this set and takes uh, real values. And this will determine the growth. And so this is what I meant. So the, the evolution of a d-dimensional grown surface, remember everything is determined by the height function, is driven by phi. And by that, I mean that at every time t plus one, the, the height is a function of the heights at all points uh, on, on up and down. So this is the way we're going to have our uh, evolution. And it is deterministic because I don't have here this uh, plus the Z, Z, the Z IID random variables here. So that's deterministic. And uh, this can be an arbitrary function which has to have some uh, uh, assumptions. And uh, now I'm going to show to you some general assumptions uh, on phi uh, for uh, which if we use them, we can get um, uh, uh, something nice at the end. Okay, 
So here are the first assumptions that we're going to put on phi. Uh, we're going to have equivalence under constant shifts. What does this mean? That's big words to say that if I have a surface which in a time t, I raise it by c, the whole surface, then you expect that time t plus one, the whole surface to be have been raised by, by c again. Right? So you add something at all points, the whole thing moves up. Then you expect uh, some kind of monotonicity in these models, meaning that if you have a surface, which is another surface at time t, then it will remain above at time t plus one. So that's, a, if you like, a monotonicity or a maximum principle type of assumption. And, uh, and I claim that uh, without justifying that, that these assumptions are very natural uh, from the physical point of view and are satisfied by many of the standard discrete time models. So again, equivalence under constant shifts, everything changes. You change the, the height by C everywhere, then the, the, the changing by C and monotonicity. The next thing you need to determine here is the scaling you are, you are going to impose. So again, some notation, the integer part of something, and uh, what I mean for a vector is this. And uh, we're going to see that there are two prevailing scalings. One is uh, hyperbolic. So you scale like x over epsilon, t over epsilon. The notation becomes complicated because I'm scaling x takes, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm having points with integer values here. So uh, you scale parabolically, uh, hyperbolically, or you scale uh, uh, parabolically. I'm sorry, hyperbolic scaling or parabolic scaling. And uh, the, um, the height function uh, uh, at time t is determined by, um, uh, let's assume phi of zero is zero, so I don't have to uh, worry about that term. Uh, uh, so we introduce now this function, which is defined everywhere by the, to be the height function at the points x epsilon t of epsilon. It's just notation. This is a canonical way. It looks messy, but I start from a discrete problem and I try to make it continuous in space. That's the only thing I'm doing here. And the goal is to investigate what happens as epsilon goes to zero to this u epsilon. So the scalings I'm going to look at, the universal scalings would be the hyperbolic or parabolic and uh, we'll see what happens. Uh, how do you determine whether it, uh, which is the right scaling, parabolic or, or hyperbolic? Um, this has to do with uh, how the dynamics move planes, right? So if you start with a plane and you move it with a hyperbolic scaling, if it moves, then you use hyperbolic scaling. If you move it with a parabolic scaling, uh, if you, on the other hand, if it doesn't move, then you have to go to parabolic scaling. Um, I always think of the scalings as some kind of asymptotic expansion at infinity in terms of time. So the hyperbolic scaling is a scale like uh, you expand things like one over t, and uh, the scaling in space is there uh, only to keep things from running out at infinity. And the parabolic scaling, you use it when the the first term of the expansion is zero, then you go to the next one. So that's the, the way I think of the scalings. Um, okay, so um, now that becomes messy, uh, but I, I so don't worry about the, the, the details. I, here I route again, what is the surface uh, growth model? Um, and uh, if you scale hyperbolically, uh, you, you just sub add a change here, the variables to the integer parts. And the key thing I want you to remember for the rest of the talk is that I, I, I can introduce this abstract function here that says that at, uh, at time epsilon, at time t, the height, the scale height is the, um, uh, this function, uh, this uh, operator, if you like, applied to what it was at t minus epsilon. Okay. and. Uh, uh, the S epsilon typically is going to have this form. So this is the growth. And uh, you have this, uh, the notation is complicated because I'm trying to write one thing, both for the hyperbolic and parabolic scalings. So this is the rule. Remember at the scale level, 
there is a there is a rule that tells you how to go from time t minus epsilon to time t. That's the only thing to remember. The parabolic scaling, of course, it's a little bit more uh, uh, complicated. Uh, notice that earlier I, I used t over epsilon squared and x over epsilon. It turns out in order to write a model in a unified way, it's better to write this way. And also the parabolic scaling is done again by some operator. The only difference between this and the one uh, before is here there was epsilon and here there is square root of epsilon. So these are the two uh, uh, scalings I'm going to use. And now I have to move use two more assumptions. Remember so far I had monotonicity and invariance by uh, the equivariance by constants. And now I'm going to, to introduce an assumption which says that there is some consistency that um, infinitesimally this uh, um, map S epsilon, uh, if, uh, we, I can calculate infinitesimally the, um, the speed of the, and uh, so that means that if I look at, uh, at some configuration of psi, and then I see where this thing is moved by epsilon, and if I define by epsilon, think of it as computing the velocity, what I get is some function that will depend on the gradient of the function psi and on the Hessian. Okay. Uh, this is because I want to come up with an equation. So I want to find the time derivative. And the second assumption is that this uh, abstract uh, written uh, object here is well posed so that if I write down this PDE, and that PDE, now clearly I'm not writing an equation, I'm writing two inequalities, that for these two PDEs, I have a comparison principle. A subsolution is below the super solution. Okay, so these are the whole assumptions. I will show you in a minute in, in particular things what happened. And, and here's the main result. If the height functions are satisfy equivariance, monotonicity, have this consistency property, and the limit problem is well posed, then the u epsilons indeed converge to the unique solution of the of the PDE that is determined by the, the um, consistency property. All these things are abstract. I will come with examples very quickly. Uh, from all these assumptions, the most difficult to check are the consistency and the, uh, and, uh, the um, fact that the limit problem is well posed. So consistency, well posedness are the main assumptions. Once you have these two, then the proof is, uh, is based on a very classical argument that tells you that uh, monotone consistent uh, schemes uh, converge. And, uh, and so let me skip the rest of the, of the blah blah here and go to examples. But first of that, before that, I want to explain to you how I get the equation. And so let's assume that I have a growth model that uh, is modeled at the scale level by this equation this operator is epsilon. Assume for now that the u epsilon is smooth and I want to show asymptotically that the u epsilon converts to something that satisfies a PD. So it's, it's natural to write down the difference between uh, what happens at time t and the time t minus epsilon. From the definition, this thing is the operator, uh, it, since this is the definition, this is u epsilon t minus epsilon, the location x minus, uh, is an epsilon missing here, minus this. So this difference, I uh, divided by epsilon and now, uh, and I divide here by epsilon. And the assumption was that the right-hand side, if you divide by epsilon, that was a consistency, this thing goes to something. This was the assumption I made. And that's more or less the proof, apart from the fact that I assume here that everything is smooth. So where do I use the monotonicity in the equivariance? I'm using it in order to remove the smoothness assumption to pass to the limit and to make sense of the limiting equation. Okay, so this is the smooth proof, the proof of what I described when everything is smooth, and then you need to do some work to prove it. So let's do now, let's go for um, uh, examples. I'm going to skip that, I'm running out of time. And let me uh, show you um, some of the concrete examples, and if there is time, I will, uh, I, I will come back. So uh, um, if you look at the directed last per passage percolation, you remember this was the thing that was going to the right. 
uh, and what you get here, if you look, uh, this was a model that was proposed by Krug and Spohn in a very classical paper in mathematical physics, which um, it's famous and um, uh, I still have difficulties understanding all the arguments that are there. It's a formal paper, so anything goes when you do, we may have this experience when you start doing very formal uh, things, uh, something is large, something is small, and somehow we can make everything work out the way we want. So they proposed uh, uh, this model as a way to derive KPZ type nonlinearity for sub with subquadratic growth models. So their claim was that if you take any directed last first correlation model, deterministic, at the end, you are going to get a PDE like that. And notice there is no square here. So this is like a KPZ equation with subquadratic growth. And the dynamics they proposed were this, uh, uh, the um, one-sided going percolation, the largest thing uh, th uh, that I mentioned before. So at T plus one, we are at the largest height. Uh, it turns out that here the hyperbolic scaling is the appropriate scaling. And rigorously, one can prove that the well-posed macroscopic equation you get when you do this thing and you apply the theory I described is this. This is a strange looking Hamilton-Jacobi equation where it says that uh, uh, what you look is you look at the largest and absolute value partial derivative and at every time you move in that direction. So you can think of a very crazy shape. Huh? So that's the limit equation in this, in this problem, which is far away from what uh, was conjectured by, uh, conjectured by Krug and Spohn. Now, uh, if I take um, another example, which now I'm going to take the old the Edwards Wilkinson model. Remember the old Ed Edward Wilkinson model was looking just, I forget this term, and that the, it, it was just looking at that average. It's the thing I said that looks like the heat equation. But now I'm making something nonlinear. Namely, I'm adding the location, the height here, and here I'm subtracting. So if I didn't put the positive parts here, this is the classical Edwards Wilkinson model because this will cancel with that. But here I'm putting a positive part, a part meaning I'm, I'm, I'm giving weight in a certain direction. Again, this thing is a hyperbolic scaling. And look what you get at the limit. At the limit, you get an average of the absolute value of the partial derivatives. Uh, while if we didn't put the plus here, the, uh, the um, hyperbolic scaling is trivial, and at the limit, you get the heat equation. So the fact that I made the dynamics non-smooth uh, non here by introducing this positive part makes the hyperbolic scaling being the, the, uh, the, the relative scaling, and you get at the limit this Hamilton-Jacobi equation. Okay, I think time is really flying. I'm not going to try to explain that. Uh, I'm going to go now directly to the parabolic scaling and uh, uh, where uh, I'm, I'm claiming that my function phi, uh, again, skip the details. Let's go to the what is the, the conclusion. I have now the key thing here is I have smooth dynamics and uh, which uh, allow me to satisfy all the properties I had before. Uh, it turns out that the correct scaling here is the parabolic scaling. And here's the equation I'm going to get at the limit. The macroscopic equation I get at the limit is, um, uh, uh, it has uh, some anisotropy. So this is like an anisotropic heat equation plus the Hamilton-Jacobi part, which is basically an, iso an anisotropic uh, quadratic. And in principle, this is like a KPZ type evolution. So if you evolve with smooth dynamics, indeed you get a KPZ type uh, nonlinearity, Laplacian plus quadratic, okay? As I said, the special case of that is the KPZ, okay. So now let's talk about the, 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 uh, some concrete examples. So if we look at the Edward, uh, the Edward Wilkinson model, which is this average, as I said, you get the heat equation, if you get a directed polymer model, but now the, the phi is written in a very sophisticated way, then you can get the, KP, the KPZ equation. Uh, if you take uh, a model, and I want to stay, stay with this for a minute. So here I have a smooth function 
of the of the change compare that to this so in the previous transparency this was q of the difference and uh, uh, but smooth here was non smooth and, and and look at the difference that smoothness can make in that case if k if q is smooth actually what you get is a kpz while when when q was not smooth we were getting a first order hyperbolic scaling okay now let me go a, a little bit more I, i'm supposed to end at at uh, at the hour or uh, or before when is this thing when is the talk over at the hour or uh, yeah. at uh, five minutes to the hour you you have uh five minutes more five minutes more okay so here are now some more uh, sophisticated dynamics uh where the location of the of the growing interface this is now more uh, hardcore statistical uh, uh physics problem uh the location of the growing surface is determined by minimizing the total potential energy uh between this point and its neighbors and the typical the typical energy people are using here is called global dynamics so what it means is and here i'm writing the gibbs measure of this global dynamics is uh, uh you are uh, it's some exponential because it gives measure and here you see the difference in the energy between uh, where you are and the nearby points beta in this in this uh, uh model is the inverse temperature and the potential that you're using for the energy is supposed to be convex and even. Uh, so the global dynamics for a gradient Gibbs measure uh, update updates the height at X uh, uh, as the conditional using the conditional distribution of the heights at the nearby points. And look at this formula here. If I take beta infinity, so at zero temperature, uh, the trying to minimize this energy is like finding the minimum of this quantity if i let beta go to infinity the minimum the the uh, what you get here is the minimum of that and and uh, this is what determines the dynamics at, at infinite temperature uh infinite inverse temperature so the v uh if it is uh, you have a strict minimum and it's differentiable you get a unique minimizer if it's uh, not a strict minimum or if it's not differentiable there uh, you may get a whole interval of minimizers so there's some randomness and then you always pick the middle point okay so um let's uh, skip all that and let me show you uh the kinds of equations um, uh, so let me go directly to uh, yeah so here is a case where i have a smooth potential v with a strict minimum then the equation I get at the limit is like that. I see the weighted average of the second derivatives. It's a weighted average divided by that. Um, and you see there's a singularity here, depending whether alpha is bigger than two or less than two. So, uh, and uh, if uh, alpha is uh, bigger than two, what matters is when what, what happens when the gradients are zero. While if alpha is less than two, what matters is when the gradients become uh, very large. And uh, that's a rigorous result that tells you that in this case, you get this equation, which by the way, is not anymore KPZ, right? Because there is not a square, a quadratic term in the gradient. And um, so now I'm going to go on and, and show you what happens when you get in the two extreme models. So what I mentioned at the beginning, the solid to solid model, the potential you're using is very simple. Instead of being some smooth function, it's just uh, the V of Y is just absolute value of Y. So the, the rule of mechanism, the rule by which you are moving is by looking at the minimum of this sum, okay? And to make it deterministic, the phi is really the, the middle, is the median. So what phi is, is the median of this, of these locations. And in that case, here's the PD you get, and I'm writing in 2D because otherwise it's a mess. In 2D, the PD you get is whenever the first derivative is larger than the second derivative in absolute value, you get, you get half of the first derivative of the second derivative. And whether the, you have the opposite setting, when the second derivative is bigger than the first derivative, you get half of the second derivative. This is a very unusual PD. I had never seen 
that PD written down before. Uh, for those of you who know a little bit about infinity Laplacian, after the fact, is, you can think of this as the infinity Laplacian that corresponds to a very particular Fischler metric. So that's a rigorous result now. You scale parabolically, and that's what you get at the limit. And, um, and if you do now the restricted, what the, it's called restricted solid state model, the difference here is the, con the potential doesn't have a strict minimum, but nevertheless, it's zero in a whole interval minus AA. So in this case, the, it turns out the mechanism of moving is uh, a half of the minimum and the maximum value of the heights. And in this case, you get this equation, which um, in a naive way looks the same, if you don't pay attention, looks the same as before. Again, there is a, I'm, I'm only writing it in 2D. Um, uh, it de everything that ter is determined by which of the two partial derivatives is larger in absolute value. But inside, as an equation, you get the opposite that you said before. So here, when the first derivative is bigger than the second derivative, you get a half of the second derivative, while in the previous model, you were getting a half of the, of the, of the first derivative. Okay, these are the two crazy looking equations that uh, you get by looking at these very two special models, the SOS models where you minimize the absolute value and the restricted SOS models where you're minimizing something that looks, it's flat there. And this PD encodes uh, some certain Fischler metric. Okay, I rest here. The point is that uh, once I start using non-smooth uh, evolutions, uh, I start getting crazy PDs. The last question, which I'm not going to describe, is whether these equations are well posed. Um, and now to understand the well posedness here, one needs to know a little bit more about viscosity solutions. And one needs to understand that what you need to do is construct test functions, which basically, uh, uh, along which, the, um, the, uh, there is no singularity in the equation, all right? Uh, 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 and, uh, and, and that's uh, a very technical thing that uh, how, if I give you an F upper bar and F lower bar, how to construct appro appropriate test functions with the property that when you evaluate the equations along these test functions, the, the two things that are different in principle agree. And if you can do that, then uh, you can obtain the well poisonous. And finally, uh, some future work is to try to do some uh, uh, random uh, surface growth models, but first, but don't, instead of putting space-time white noise and uh, randomness, just put uh, um, um, color in space and white in time. And the other is to start with, uh, uh, with uh, surface growth models with Glauber dynamics, but um, instead of looking at the beginning, from the beginning uh, at uh, zero inverse temperature, uh, infinity inverse temperature, to let the temperature, inverse temperature go to infinity while you are scaling uh, in space time the mesh. Uh, both are interesting problems because nothing is known about them. And we have started working on them and um, I'm hopeful that some results will come out. Uh, I'm sorry I went late. Uh, I think that's a good time to stop. Um, I'll be happy to answer to any questions you may have, or if there's no time, uh, 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 you can um, email me questions and uh, I will uh, reply to you. Again, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to speak to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Soganidis. So now we, we open the turn for questions. So if anyone has some question, please um, uh, open. You can, you can ask directly to Professor Soganidis or you can type your question in the chat uh, as you prefer. Please, can, can I? Yes, yes, of course. So, Professor Soganitz, uh, thank you very much for this wonderful talk. I do not expect more less than that. <laughs> uh, in respect to the handle in case, to, to resolve the, the KPZ equation, uh, used to work with roof path, and the roof path is, is constructing with respect to Laplace. So, mm -hmm. that could, 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 could help, could, could, could be construct some, 
some uh, idea like hook path using the the the, the Asian. I mean, you have. Uh, a, uh, of the, I, yeah. I understand what you are asking. Um, I, I, what I'm doing is much simpler. Okay, uh, and and uh, what you are describing it may introduce unnecessary. Uh, uh, compl complications to the problem. What we're getting in the end, we're getting a deterministic KPZ. Okay. So there is no randomness there. When we do, if we are able to do what I call here the first problem, which is to introduce some randomness in time yeah. uh, and keeping space smooth, uh, that will be like looking at the KPZ equation and having on the right hand side some additive um uh, some uh, additive uh, white noise in time i see and and there uh, there are several ways of dealing uh, uh, with this uh, with this problem but i don't know whether this is going to it will give you something like that so to use the machinery the big machinery for the kpz uh, yeah. uh, is um, it's not necessary for this uh, problem because i'm everything i'm doing is deterministic and nevertheless no. One provides. Now I understand the title. Sorry. Now I understand the theme in Itsky. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, I so, think what I was trying to emphasize with the talk is that if you really want to do the random part, uh, there is no general theory. There are tremendous yeah. abstractions which have to do with dimension uh, and, um, uh, and dealing with the KPZ. But if you go deterministic, uh, you see that the, what makes a difference there is the regularity of the uh, increase in time of the height. And I if see. you increase regularly, then you get KPZ looking equations. But if the update you have in time is irregular, like in these two models I showed you at the S, the SOS and the RSOS, then you get very unusual PDs. Uh, at the limit, and uh, and of course there is no KPZ. So, so, so I, I have a physical curiosity. Uh, somehow the, the interface in the microscope level evolved, evolves like with, with the curvature. Some I could not see the curvature in, in the model. I say there is there is height. Um, it, it's not a level set, so you cannot see it as a, as a, in, the, the, in the clean way of the level set. But when the limiting equation at the parabolic scaling is an yeah. equation that depends on second derivatives, then you can, if you decide to write the moving set as the level set of a certain function, then right. of course that will bring in curvatures. However, the problem is not going to be uh, geometric. So it's okay. going to be, uh, if you try to write it down, it's going to be a very unusual um, uh, free boundary problem. Okay. So think of the equation there where you had the uh, WX1, X1, WX2, X2, and there is something. So it's going to get some crazy free boundary problem where in one direction you get secondary, but in, uh, this curvature in the other, you get that direct. Uh, and I don't think uh, there is mathematical theory for that. It's a very singular problem. Okay. So thank you so much. <laughs> You're welcome. Okay, any other question or comment? So. Uh, sorry. Uh, it seems to be that uh, such kind of techniques can be uh, applied to an analyzing uh, some uh, problem from mathematical geology. It's grow, grow, uh, some intrusion yeah. time. Exactly, exactly. I mean, I, I, that's why I stated the assumptions. I mean, there are certain assumptions, and if they are if they are satisfied, if the model satisfies these assumptions, then it does give you an asymptotic shape. Mm -hmm. I concentrated yeah. on uh, myself on the models from statistical uh, physics because my collaborator uh, uh, Chatterjee is a statistical physicist, and and he brought this problem to me to see how we do it. So I haven't tried to find other um, applications but uh, you know if you if you know some please uh, drop me an email i will be very happy to look at it yeah okay thank you okay any other question or comment so if not let us thanks again professor soganidis thank you very much thank you very much for your for your wonderful talk uh, so you. now i
pass the word to Professor Sandra again. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Diego, Professor Suganides, for your very nice talk. And 